Hi, this is Richard Fairbrass from Right Said Fred, and you're listening to the Nothing Shocking podcast. Want to know what's going on in the world of music? Then tune in to the Nothing Shocking podcast, a non-genre-based, all-ages friendly rock and roll program. Join us weekly for interviews with all your favorite rock stars from the mainstream to the underground. You can find us at nothingshocking.libsyn.com or anywhere you download podcasts. We're putting the band back together. The numbers all go to 11. I'm talking about bands that rock. Led Zeppelin. What about Sabbath? ACDC. Motorhead. Does that mean it's louder? Is it any louder? Well, it's one louder, isn't it? We're not worthy! We're not worthy! Why don't you just make 10 louder and make 10 be the top number and make that a little louder? These go to 11. I get up above the ground and raise my head days like this. Think I should be dead. One for Satan, two for me. Let's cheat the devil and spun. Welcome to the Nothing Shocking Podcast. I'm your co-host, Jeff Untied, and with me in Dog Bowl Studios is... Coach Nuz. You can find the Nothing Shocking Podcast on Lipson or any podcatchers. Like our Facebook page or follow us on X at No Shock Pod. You can also find the Nothing Shocking Podcast on Rock Rage Radio every Sunday morning at 7 a.m. Central Time. Our sponsor is Ragged Records, located in downtown Rock Island, Illinois, and downtown Davenport, Iowa. We like to thank the Hong Kong Sleepover for allowing us to use their music for our intro and bumper ending. Tonight's guest is Richard Fairbrass from Right Said Fred. Yeah, promoting this past May of 2023 release of the singles. And they're also promoting an upcoming festival they're participating in this August called the Freedom Festival in the United Kingdom. So let's get to that interview. All right, good night. Good night. Richard, welcome to the Nothing Shocking Podcast. I'd like to introduce you to my co-host, Jeff Unteed. Richard, thanks for joining us today. Hi, Jeff. Hi. Nice to be Well, nice to be with you, even though I'm at some distance, obviously. Yeah. yeah. Where are you based, by the way? Where, where are in America? Well, we're in the center. We're right in the middle, uh, the Mississippi River between Iowa and Illinois, right in the, right in the middle of the U.S. Oh, oh is, is that Trump country or Biden country? <laughs> a little bit of both. Yeah, a little. Yeah, it's, <laughs> yeah we're, it's, a, it's a crapshoot around here. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, same here. <laughs> well, very good. Absolutely. Well, let's get right to this here, though. This past May of 2023, Right Said Fred released the band's newest album, The Singles. Can you give our listeners an insight to the uh, creative process to this latest endeavor? Yeah, well, that, that, that was, um, we were asked to do that by a, a, a marketing company. And uh, we decided, you know, we was hit with the choice, really, of either just repeating what we'd done before or or trying to re- not trying to reinvent, but, but coming up with attitudes that we had on the single that we hit at the time that we didn't have at the time, rather. Mm-hmm. So, um, and it was so we played everything afresh, and it was it was uh, it was interesting actually because some of the stuff was surprisingly easy to do, and some of the songs were more difficult to, to pin down. Um, but we enjoyed it, and it, it was, and also we're independent, so it was it was a uh, we had to obviously watch the budget the whole time, and um, and we you know it was, I enjoyed it. It was it was good, and it, also some of the stuff the, the early stuff that we did, you I forget how good it was. You know, it's, it's mm. one of those you know you, you tend to get used to tracks. You know what I mean? You kind of you, know, you just take it for granted, and then you hear it back again. You think actually that's pretty good. You know? Absolutely. Yeah. When you go back and you um, listen to some of these singles, do you do you uh, you know have a hard time figuring out which ones you're going to pick, or is it pretty pretty simple? No, it's pretty. It's pretty simple. We're always torn between the ones that are popular and ones we like. Yeah, you know that, that that's not always the same. So it sometimes there are tracks that there's a track, for instance, uh, that, that was a huge hit in Germany um, a few years ago, and uh, we have trouble trying to find things in it that we like. <laughs> so, <laughs> <Yeah. we don't, laughs> you know, where there are other songs that we that, that didn't do anything, and and we really like them. So it's always an issue of, of choosing songs either that that were really popular or that you personally really, really like, you know, so that's always, it's always a discussion that Fred and I have. 
Very good. You know, Spiritual War is my favorite track off the singles album. Can you talk us talk to us a little bit more about the you know the the challenges of that song? Was it a difficult song to to write and record, or did it come pretty easy to you and your brother? No, it came pretty easy. It was unusual for us to write a song that that we that we that was not about boy girl love sex, you know, being sexy, whatever. It was mm-hmm. it was it was interesting to write a song that had some kind of uh, a spine, if you like, like a philosophical spine. Um, we know a a, um, a, a a Jesuit priest who's actually in Honduras at the moment doing what the, what they describe these days as good works. And he he sort of gave us the not gave us the idea, but he was talking about this being a spiritual war, that what that what the West is in is a spiritual war. And I never really thought about it like that. But the minute he started talking about it, and then Fred and I sort of, chewed it over and as time has gone on that's increasingly what i think and what i often think is when i know it sounds corny to say it but when god walks out the room the devil walks in that's what i think happens mm. you know so that's what that's that's what that song's about and i, and I think it is one of those you know it is uh, you tolerate this and your children will be next it's, it's that kind of thing yeah, very good jeff um, well mm. i know you, you guys released a single in 2022 godsend and that's on the album can you talk a little bit yeah. uh, behind the, the story behind that one well, it's, I just think people don't think don't think about. We talk about sex a lot, yeah. And you, you know, it's all about you know the, the sort of the Sam Smith nonsense, you know. Um, and but we don't talk about. I don't think people talk about love in a serious way enough. Um, and actually, at the end of the day, that's all that's left. Whether mm. it's between two friends or a partner or whatever it is, or you know your church, whatever it happens to be. And I think I think we think far too much in t- in material terms now and not in um in spiritual terms and at the moment i'm reading a book by um, yuval harari you know the um the, the klaus schwab um advisor whatever you want to call him a book called sapiens which came out some time ago and it's it, it's really good i mean it's really really strong but but there's a kind of loveliness lovelessness about it it doesn't have much warmth it's, it's like a, it's like asking a, ma- a magician to explain the sistine chapel you know, it's a, there's a there's a, a philosophical gap between the way one person thinks and what is and what is what is real. That's what God sends about. It's about that if you love it, love well, that's what we say. Love is a God sent. That's what it is, and we take it for granted far too easily, and we forget it as well. We we think we can measure it by things like money, or we can measure it by you know the things we own or or all the friends we have. But actually, it's it's a very precious thing, and uh, I don't think we value it enough. Very good. We we talked to so many artists throughout the years doing this, and you know their their thought process of of you know musicianship opposed to songwriting. You know, it's for for you. Um, you know, how do you view yourself? Do you view yourself more as a songwriter and or maybe less of a musician, or do you think of yourself as a musician first, songwriter second? No, musician first, uh, songwriter first, musician second, definitely. Yeah, I, well, that's the thing that Fred and I enjoy the most. Uh, t- it's two things, really, which is writing the song in the first place and then performing the song once it's finished. Those are the two things that keep us going. Um, so the last three years has been particularly stressful because we were cancelled by pretty much everybody. Mm. Um, we, couldn't, we couldn't work for three years at all, really. So that was quite stressful. So that's so we got into songwriting uh, more intently, uh, intensely, I think, then. Um, but uh, no, I don't think of myself as a, mu- as a musician, really. Um, I think of myself as a, as a as a songwriter. We both do, and I think we're both pretty good at hooks. I think we're quite good at hooks. Yeah. Uh, but we we're not. Yeah, but we're not very good at playing the game. <laughs> <You know? laughs> there is a yeah. there's, there's a massive there's a massive game to play in pop music these days. And, you, and if you you know you either play it or you don't. And we're just not particularly motivated to play that game. We just do what we do and and hope that people catch up with it. You know. Hey, you, you, Maybe you can shed some light on you know the challenges of, of being a songwriter in the now opposed to back in your earlier days. And we talked to many artists, especially Nashville artists, where they mm. they, they get their songs from a database in Nash in, in Nashville yeah. from so many different songwriters. It's like a it's like a meta uh, base. Or yeah. what, what it, and you know, maybe talk about I guess maybe doing the, the the songwriting thing in the now opposed to in your early day. Yes. Well, yeah, the big the big difference now. We were just looking at Billboard actually. We we're just checking it on the uh, on the computer. And what's interesting, they'll have a song. They'll 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 list a song in its chart position. But if you want to find out who wrote it, you've got to go to Wikipedia. Mm. 
it's not listed. And, and what has happened in the in the intervening years since we started is that the it, the backroom boys, for want of a better word, you know, the, the producers, the lyricists, the writers, the engineers, all, the, all these, they've all, they're all disappeared. They've all gone. The only thing, the two things you get when you download a track is the artist's name and the title of the track. And I remember buying back stuff like the Steely Dan I remember one Steely Dan album. They actually listed on the on the, it, was a, it was a sleeve, double sleeve thing. <clears throat> they actually listed all the all the technical equipment they used in the studio, what yeah. kind of mic it was on the yeah. on the kick, and all this kind of stuff, you know. And it was brilliant. I loved all I loved all that. And that's so that's one of the big differences as a, as a writer. You're much more invisible now. Um, some writers probably like that. They probably are probably okay with it. Um, but there is that is a, a big difference between um, once the internet kicked in and people started downloading songs and you download. You download the, the sound of the song and the artist, but you don't really, most people don't really give a shit who, who wrote it or who produced it or how it was produced mm-hmm. or anything else. So, so and that's one of the, you know, that's, I, think it's a, it's, I think it's a real shame because the music industry is a, coll- a collaborative thing. A record is a collaborative thing. Yes. And all the people involved in it should get a fair shake, I think. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, I wanted mm-hmm. to talk a little bit about your your deep voice and uh, um, you know in, in pop and 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 dance it's it's kind of unique and and I like it. So can you tell a little bit about you know your your voice style? Yeah. Well, I wanted to be Steve Tyler when I was younger. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> That's how I. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> That's what I wanted to wanted to be. Um, and then we did sexy. Um, and when the sexy the I'm that bottom yeah. note is, a, is a, that's an E. That's an E. And um, I didn't know that I could do that until I did it. And when I did the vocal for "Sexy," that's when I suddenly thought, "Oh fuck, I can actually, I can actually hit that uh, that bottom E." And actually, we did a song a few about two years ago, which was number one on the on the on the, on the chart over here, called "Tide." Yeah. And the bottom note that I can I can hit was a, is a bottom D. Oh wow. Um, so it's it's really low. And um, so I didn't really know that I could do that until we until we did "I'm Too Sexy," and then we did. You know, stuff like deeply dip and all that, and then we started to to use it more, I think, um, and to be much more uh, um, aware of where my voice was. And I, and I mean, I just yeah, it's it's weird. I mean, I, I've been asked to do a, um, a track by a producer that we know, and I'm going to be I'll be there in a couple of in a couple of weeks, I think. Um, and he wants me. He, he he said the reason he wants me to do it is because he thinks that there's a there's a kind of Johnny Cashy kind of vibe to it. Mm. Um, and I did you know, I was just I was just listening to um, Hurt. Johnny Cash. I mean, please come on. Oh, yeah, absolutely, yeah. absolutely, absolutely, absolutely brilliant. So, um, so I, yeah, I just, uh, I don't think about it. I just kind of do it. Um, the only thing I would that I criticise, if I was going to be really critical of me, um, I, if I, if I try and sing too high, I lose what they call head voice. Yeah. Mm. Oh, yeah. And I, lo- yeah, I, there's a spine in the voice that that tends to go. That's why Ella Fitzgerald was so brilliant because she, the spine in her voice in the tone was right through the scale from the bottom note to the top. It was there the whole time. And um, that's a very tricky thing to do. You're either born with it, I think, or you, or you, if, you if you're lucky, you can learn it. Um, but that's the only thing. So I tend, it, the easy thing for me is, is to sit in that bass baritone vibe all the time. Um, but you stepping outside your, your comfort zone is good for you occasionally. Um, but there, that's what it was. So it was just saying it was sexy that did it, hitting that bottom note in the bass because the, the riff, da, 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 that, that, it, that, E major scale riff, I had to hit the bottom E, and that's when I realized I could do it. Do you yeah. have any type of vocal exercises that you use to uh, keep your voice in shape? No, I stopped smoking, um, which, which helps. <laughs> yeah. Although, although having said that, Sinatra spoke for years, and he was getting better and better as he got older. <laughs> so I don't know, but I, I, I took, I took lessons for a while. Um, and there's a guy I, I, I work, I have, have been working with for some time now. And he was the vocal coach on um, that a very a big. Uh, it was a uh, what the hell was it? A massive movie, massive movie with Russell Crowe and all these people. And he had to vocal coach the whole cast. So, and I've got had some really interesting lessons from him about opening the throat and keeping keeping your throat loose. That's the key to if you want to keep singing for a long time, you have to try and keep the the throat lo- loose. Your vocal mm-hmm. cords loose. The minute you tighten up. Which is why a lot of rock singers lose their voices after after a, a time because it's just it's it's too much on the on the on the on the throat. So, I got some good tips off him. So I do I don't warm up though. I don't do any warming up. Um, I don't. Uh, we, what we try and do when we do shows, we try and make the first song a relatively comfortable song for me to do, mm. so that I can use the first song as a kind of warm up. 
but I, I'm not one of those people that sits in the dressing room going through the scales. <laughs> you, know? Yeah. you know what I mean? I, that would <laughs> shoot me if I ever end up doing that. You know? Absolutely. Um, kind of want to switch gears on you here. Uh, talk a little bit more about uh, you know modern day technology recording. You know, we're seeing so many artists now that are being able to record tracks, albums out of their own home, opposed to going into a proper studio uh, for you. Yeah. Um, where, where, where are you at in today? Do, do, do you prefer going to that proper studio still in, in recording your music, or do you like this new age of accessibility in, in, in recording at home? Well, the recording at home is, is, I mean, it depends what kind of band you are. If you're a dance act, um, and you, you can do pretty much everything at home on a computer, uh, and I'd feel a few plugins. You really can. And you can make records at home and you can put them on Spotify and blah, blah, blah. It's easy. If you're a rock act, particularly if you're using, if you're, if the audience is important to what you do, um, and, you know, it's a much more organic kind of analog thing, then I think it's a bad time to be making music. It's, it's a difficult time. I can only speak of London. Um, but when we started, pretty much every pub in London was a gig and and bands would play that was and that was the thing and now there's almost no, all the, most of the gigs have shut down so if you're a rock band it's very hard to find places to play um from our point of view we tend to go to studios we tried having our own studio but what all we did was sit around and make tea that's all we did <laughs> yeah. because we weren't paying yeah. we weren't we weren't paying for it but there's nothing like you know nothing like it's like death and taxes it really focuses the mind you know and um so when we we stopped doing that closed the studio down and now we go to a guy that we know in uh, not far from about an hour an hour away and uh, he's just really chilled we really enjoy working with him um and that that, that we, we were talking earlier about the singles album we, we did that there mm. the whole album with him and it was because we were paying for the time that we managed to get it done in the time if we had been at home trying to do this, it would have, we'd still be working on it. You know, it, it would have been impossible. So um, from that point of view, I think for us personally, it helps to go to a studio. I think for a lot of artists, but as I say, particularly dance artists, they, you can do a lot of this stuff at home. You really, really can. Um, so it, it depends on the genre, I think. It depends on the genre. And and, the, um, and also, of course, if you, if, 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 from our point of view, producers are absolutely crucial. So we've, we've just started working with a guy called Sam Williams who did – uh, Supergrass stuff and Plan B and all that, and um, it uh, just having that input is really really useful. And he can make, I mean, he can do all this this stuff with in his in his in his house. I mean, he can make tracks sound absolutely brilliant. He doesn't need a big studio at all. And some of the plugins that you have now are absolutely brilliant. You know, mm. um, there was a story about I think it was um, Def Leppard. I think they asked their fans to spot whether they could tell whether the, the, the guitar sounds were analog or digital. And everybody got it wrong. Everything was digital. <laughs> everybody, they all thought it was a stack of marshals, you know, and all that. And it wasn't. It was all digital. So it's, you know, it, it's, it's horses for courses. It depends how you like to work. But we prefer working in the studio where we're paying for it because it focuses us on getting the stuff done. Very good. Yeah. Well, you know, I just want to talk about the impact of I'm Too Sexy. The, you know, it's been in over 40 television shows and movies. The song yeah. will probably yeah. continue to be played for, for years. You know, we talked yeah. to Don McLean about uh, American Pie and the song will probably be played forever. You know, but Absolutely. can you just talk about that impact of, of the song and what it means to you that it'll probably carry on past? Yeah, I don't, you know, it's, it's a weird thing. When we did it, we only did it. We did it because we thought it was funny. Oh yeah. And we did it because yeah, and we thought it was it was it wasn't like anything else. That's yeah. why we did it. Um, and it nobody was more surprised than us <laughs> that people started picking up and picking up on it. Really, we didn't. Yeah. Never crossed our minds for a single second. And uh, I can remember going to Belgium for the first promo and thinking we were in the plane. I remember thinking. Oh my God! You can have a hit abroad as well. Oh, this is amazing! And suddenly, <laughs> suddenly, I was, was so green, you know, so yeah. completely green. And sexy is just—it is one. I don't understand it. I, I think it's a, it is a um, it is an, it's a bit of an enigma for us. I'll tell you what it what it feels like. It feels like having a child, a daughter, that you love and you cherish, and you you're right behind all that. It's all fantastic, and then the daughter leaves home. And becomes a prostitute. <laughs> and, <there's, laughs> and that it's that you still love her. You still love the, you know, you st we still love the track, but it's a kind of prostitute. <laughs> That's how we feel about it. <laughs> uh, Very you know, good. It's like that. Well, yeah. let's get focused in on, on, on the now. Yeah. Um, 2024, yeah. uh, what are the plans for any new music from Right Said Fred? Anything? Yeah. 
Well, we've, we've just worked, as I say, we've just started working with Sam Williams, um, and we've got a single coming out, which is, we've it's our first cover we've ever really, well, it's about the second cover we've ever done. It's the cover of the beloved track, um, Sweet Harmony. And we've done a cover of that, which is getting some pickup in Germany right now. We we haven't taken it anywhere else, actually, to be honest with you. Um, and we've got uh, we we're, we're we're busy writing the whole time. So once there is a track that we're waiting for, there's a couple of ideas in it where we need to get cleared before we do it. So we are things are beginning to thaw out. I mean, the last three years have been really really tough. I won't lie, you know, it's been, it has been really tough. Mm. And as an artist, the only way you can work as an artist in the last three years is if you buy the bullshit. If you don't buy the bullshit, you're going to be in trouble. And that's what happened to us. Mm. Uh, we weren't prepared to turn into Howard Stern and yeah. uh, and and, Sch and Schwarzenegger and all these terrible people who just bought it hook, line, and sinker and then insulted everybody else. We weren't going to do that. So uh, we, it, that's why I was saying to you earlier, you know, we just um, we, we just got on with writing and um, and and uh, and kept ourselves to ourselves. But it is beginning to thaw out now. We've got, as you say, we've got the Freedom Festival in August. Uh, we've got this single coming out in Germany in the next few months. Um, and we, uh, we're looking to get another single out before Christmas after that. Um, and all, it's, it's just a, you have to decide why you're doing it mm. at the end of the day. And that mm -hmm. sounds a stupid bloody question, but you really have to decide, am I doing this because we're pleasing the record company? Am I doing this because of management? Am I doing this for money? Or am I doing it because I actually quite enjoy it? What is yeah. it? Well, you know, it's yeah. important to. I don't think artists think about that hard enough, actually. Well, for some artists, I mean, I mean, there are some artists obviously do, but I think a lot of artists just get on that that hamster wheel, uh, the record company hamster wheel, and they just have to keep turning out, turning out, turning out stuff, um, and you lose yourself, I think, if you're not careful. Um, so we've got, and, and next year is looking good in terms of gigs. To, uh, next year is looking really good. So we're just keeping our fingers crossed and hope that. Uh, monkeypox or disease x or <laughs> whatever it is doesn't <laughs> doesn't come out and stop it all of, all of a sudden you know so uh if we just keep going and see what happens yeah absolutely okay well um let's uh talk a little bit more about the freedom festival you, you guys are scheduled august 10th yeah uh, what can the yep. uh, uh what can the uh, fans expect from your set list uh what do you know about this festival i i, I believe this is a new festival correct it is yes it is I, what, what's happened is uh, in the i don't know what it's like in I know we know a couple of artists in America who are um, on, on the, what you might call the freedom circuit, if you like. Mm. Um, in the UK, it's been it's been patchy. We don't know much about this festival. Um, in terms of what we intend to to do, obviously, you know, there are tracks that people want to hear us do, um, and we don't have a problem with that at all. Um, the only, I think the under the motivating thing for for us is to make the thing make the music s slightly heavier than it was, a bit a little bit more. Not quite so fluffy, I mm. guess is the is the you know, do you know what I mean? It just so I mean sex is a fluffy track, but you can deliver it with a bit more oomph, a little bit more edge, if yeah. you like. Um so that's that's our plan. We've got we're looking we're we're sort of putting feelers out now for players and um uh, there's a couple of people we've got in mind and there's a guy that we work in worked in, in London who who knows quite a few people. So we'd we're sort of planning it, putting it together we don't really want to we could go out as a dj set i think with a computer and blah 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 but i you know it's not fun you know it's really good fun if you've got a band on stage it just is um so that's our plan we want to try and do it as as real as we can there'll be some stems running percussion shit like that because we obviously it's expensive to carry stuff like that around <laughs> and artists like that around <laughs> but but uh but the, it, it'll be about we're looking at something like four or five or six on stage, something like that. Um, and, I, you know, it's just, I like to, it sounds corny, but I, I like to cheer people up. That's what I like doing. I like yeah. when, when we go to a show, I like people to look like they're having a good time. I'm not Tom York, <laughs> you know, that's, 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 not, that's not my vibe. God bless him. I'm sure he's all that fantastic, but it's not my thing. Um, so, if, and I'm watching some old stuff from Leonard Skinner back in the day, uh, in 1984. And you know, the, it's a, it's I can't remember where it is. A massive, massive uh, festival, sunshine, and everybody's having you know it's Freebird, and they're having an absolute blast. It's brilliant, it's absolutely brilliant. And I think there's an element of pop mu music that's got a little bit po faced lately, a mm. little bit you know takes itself a little bit too seriously. I think yeah. you know you can take the music seriously, but you don't take the business too seriously. I don't think. Absolutely. Well, outside of the Freedom Fest, uh, what will Wright said Fred's summer tour look like? Are you guys doing any type of proper touring? Are you doing any like weekend stuff? What, you, what what's going on? 
Well, it, I think it, this, this will depend on on the on the, the traction that the, tra the the single gets. I think, you know, uh, we the luck it, our best year up until the nonsense was 19, uh, 2019, and we had a full a full year of that. And that was all, as you say, going in, doing festivals, going in at weekends, and coming back home. Doing a hard ticket tour would depend entirely, I think, on the traction that the single gets. If the single gets traction, and it's you know we we've already got some invites. Uh, already, which is looking pretty good. So I think that's that's how we'll take it. We'll take it one step at a time. And if this thing starts to starts to move, then we'll start looking at uh, at um, work in, in uh, particularly in Europe. Um, we've just uh, we're working with a company in Germany now called Michel, who are um, who are a big agent in in Germany. So and you know you go where the love is. That's what you have to do if you're an artist. You go where the love is. You don't you don't bang your head against a brick wall when, in a in a territory where they all hate you. There's no point. So we, we, Germany and Europe has always been good for us. We've always had a good time in the States. In fact, we were offered that we had Coachella phoned us up just before Christmas. Oh, wow. If you can believe that. Yeah, yeah I know. Coachella phoned up and they said, are you available for, for you know, to do the shows? And stuff? So we said, absolutely. It's just before Christmas. Absolutely. Yes. They said, we'll send you a, uh, we'll send you a, um, you know, a contract and all the details and everything else. That was just before Christmas. That's the last thing we heard. Oh, <laughs> 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 so you know, we take one day at a time. We don't uh, we we don't um, plan too far ahead. We just see how the days go, and uh, and because the last three years has been b bizarre, it, it has been really bizarre. Um, so we've uh, we 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 tend to just uh, uh, you know, as I say, take it one day at a time. And uh, I think we'll I, personally, I think we'll probably do Coachella next time. Uh, but you know, it, it's but we don't we're not planning it. We're just uh, but I have a feeling we probably will. Oh, very good. Yeah. Well, we talked yeah. a little bit about you know releasing singles, and 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 the music industry has changed. And I know you guys had a couple a couple of EPs that you did and uh, a couple of years ago, but it, I think it was 2017 was the last full length album. Um, can you talk about yeah. the bands? Uh, are you going to continue to do singles and EPs, or or will there be another oh. full length? Oh yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, we've got we've got a whole pile of songs to do. Um, because we're independent, we uh, we obviously we finance everything, we we pay for everything, so um, we have we're very very mindful of cost. So that's why with this with the, with the single we've just done, we'll see how that goes. And before we commit to spending any more money on the next single, it will be dependent on how this one goes. Um, and, and it's the same with the, you know with the with the festival in August. It's the same thing you know, with all the players and rehearsals and everything else. We pay for it. It comes out of our money. There's nobody. There's no bank. There's no record company just shelling out cash. So we are, you know, we have to be fairly mindful of that. And uh, but I, you know, we would in, uh, we are absolutely committed to doing more tracks and more writing. It's what we do. Absolutely. Well, speaking of dollars and cents, you, you guys have a very successful online store. And you know, the thing that amazed me about your online store is very simple to navigate. When you go to so many of these other bands' websites and trying to navigate their online store is is well, it's a it's a job in itself. But you guys have kind of you, you've simplified things to uh, make it really accessible for the the fan to navigate your website. So talk a little bit more about your online store and 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 what what can uh, fans uh, get or what what's available at your online store? Well, we've what we I think Fred does most of the, uh, the the technical stuff on for the online store. And I think what he's done, and the, the guy he worked with a guy called Ian Newton, we worked with him. And he, I think they both basically, their position is, if we can make it simple enough for Richard to use, then it's going to be simple enough for anybody to use. <laughs> so I'm like, I'm the I'm the kind of the guinea pig because I don't know anything about stuff at all. And uh, the only thing I do Twitter or X, whatever you call it now, but so that's about as far as it goes. Um, and uh, but the, the, you know, we, we merch has always been a, a tr tricky thing for us because we've. Um, we did a whole load of designs a few years ago, which Fred and I thought were absolutely hysterical and brilliant, and then nobody liked them. <laughs> it was just <laughs> nobody. Nobody. We thought they were hysterical, and we were the only ones laughing. And uh, so we've, 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 since that time, we've brought other people on board, and there's a guy called Steve Beatty who worked with him, uh, who runs a lot of the merch stuff for us. Um, and it's, it's, you know, we, we defer to people who know what they're doing with regards to, to merch. And Steve Beatty um, has been this guy who, who helps us with merch has been really supportive, really, really good, really helpful. Um, and uh, um, but, but again, so, you know, it's the same. It's the same old thing. If you're an independent, you, you it's hands on pr in, with pretty much everything you do. 
you don't you don't offload the, the work to anybody else you know absolutely so um yeah so that's uh, but the, yeah but we we one thing we have learned is not to design the stuff ourselves because <laughs> otherwise <laughs> it's a disaster <laughs> fair enough <laughs> yeah so prior to prior to Right Said Fred, which was formed in 1989, uh, you worked with yeah. uh, Boy George, David Bowie, and yeah. um, Mick Jagger. Can you talk a little bit about yeah. uh, your pre-band uh, days? Well, that was yes. It was we were doing gigs all you know in London all the time, restaurants and bars, and we did a bit of busking and all that kind of stuff. And Fred's girlfriend at the time was a choreographer. Mm. And uh, back in the day in the 80s, if you remember. Every video had to have dancing in it. Yeah. It wasn't possible to do oh, a video yeah. without dancers. Yeah. You remember? Yeah. So, so Teresa had got a lot of that work, and um, she was the one that introduced us into you know to, to audition for the Bowie thing and the and the, and the uh, Mick Jagger thing. Um, and we got a lot of sort of video work back in the day before the band broke through her because it, it's because of those connections through choreography, you know. Um, and it was uh, what I learned actually with with particularly with with David Bowie, who was really really nice i've got to say he was a really sort of um he quite shy i thought at, yeah. at the time um but very communicative not not at all standoffish um but what i learned is that he was he was just a bloke but yeah. really you know a great a great artist but he is just a bloke and it's the same with mick jay they're, they're just people and uh it, it it's good to, to be up close with people like that because you just really you can see the hairs on their forearm and you suddenly think no, it's just a bloke. Mm. That's it. You know, there's nothing. Do you know what I mean? You're not. Oh yeah. You know, I'm not. It's important not to be too awestruck by by people. I think. Um, and I, it was. And I learned. It, it was a really good learning curve. And of course, back then, I got three hundred pounds for a day, which back which was more money than I'd ever seen in my entire life. Yeah. Um, I could. I couldn't believe. I couldn't believe. You know how how much money was involved. And uh, and also, it's quite exciting when you're a kid. You know, to get on a, on a on a sort of video set with all the cranes, and the cameras, and the crew, and the makeup, and all that kind of stuff. So um, it was it was really, and it helped us in, in the early stages, of course, to finance everything else we were doing when we were doing shows and stuff. You know, um, doing that work, it gave you a it gave you a ta- without being involved in the business, it gave you a taste of what the business was like. So from that point of view, it was good. It was good. It was it was very. But I remember Mick Jagger was completely different, completely different kind of guy. Um, he, he said, he said, now during, when we do this song, he said I might come up against you. He might, he said I might come at you and, and sort of look like we're going to have a bit of a fight, you know. So I said, oh, okay, that's fine, that's absolutely fine. Yeah, do that. And I thought he'd just fake it. He didn't fake it at all. He, not, he fucking, I nearly went flying. You know, it was, it was that he was very serious about what he was doing. Um, but he was very, um, what's the word? You know, he was, he was very matter of fact. Oh, uh, whereas yeah. David Bowie was a little bit more, a little bit more flamboyant, I guess you'd say. You know, but it was a good time, and with, uh, with we did the Wag Club with David Bowie did that for the for the US release, I think, um, jazzing for Blue Jean. So it was yeah, it was an interesting time, and I I had fond memories of that. Very sad when he went. It was it was really sad when he went. Actually, um, a, a terrible time. Mm. You know, really. Well, you had had worked with uh, one of our past uh, guests, Phil Spalding. We had him on about five or six years ago, um, right. and, and it. People don't realize what Phil Spalding was about. He uh, was in Roger Daltrey's band. He was played in GTR, Toya, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. You, you guys were also um, uh, collaborated yourselves. Can you talk a little bit more about your your working relationship with Phil? And and, and I guess I I don't know a whole lot about it. Yeah, I mean, I, I can't remember. To be honest, completely honest with you, I can't remember how it must, it might have been through Tams and our manager at the time. Uh, who was working at Red Bus uh, Recording Studios. It might have been the, the, her connection that brought Phil in. But Phil played the whole album, the whole first album. Uh, did a lot of the Top of the Pops with us, did a lot of um, some, uh, the, you know, sort of some of the live shows as well. Um, and uh, he he was just a, just a really good bass player, just a really, really good bass player. And what I liked about him was he was really, um, what's the word for it, visceral on the bass. Mm. Some bass players are, are quite... Um, they're good in the studio and all that stuff, but they don't have that live kind of pump that that uh, that's required on uh, particularly dance music stuff. And Phil was very good at that. He played with a pick, but a lot of the, most of the time, I think, um, and was very very um, yeah visceral and sort of not exactly animalistic, but you know what I mean. He was quite you know very punchy. Mm-hmm. Um, and we yeah we did a lot of and, and Phil was very. Well, a lot of the guys we worked back worked with back then were very open to sort of late night sessions and all that kind of stuff. So. The album that we did with him 
um, say we'd go on till two or three in the morning, and uh, he, you know, he was he was always really relaxed. We we stayed in touch with Phil right up until about two years ago, I reckon, a year and a half ago, something like that. Yeah. Mm. Oh, very good. Well, yeah, we're out of our allotted time for the evening. Um, is there anything that we left off that you would like to plug or promote? No, no, no. I just uh, we, well, we put a, we, there's a, a record company. Well, I, I, I don't want to uh, what sort of company they are. Spinning Records, who are quite well known in the states, I think, as a, as a dance label, and they've just uh, they've just commissioned a remix of "Sexy," which has been done by Brian Way. Mm. And uh, and that and it's really good. I've got to say, the remix is really really good. So that that's. Uh, we're just going to see how that goes, and what I would, what we might do is, we if that goes well, we might talk to them about putting a 12-inch out of uh, a club mix out of the um, Sweet Harmony thing we've just done. Um, but before we do that, we will see how the I'm Too Sexy remix goes. Um, so that's that's the that's the only other thing that's uh, that's that's happening at the moment. And we um, we we you know, we're in touch with Five Times August and. Uh, and a few other guys in the states on the on the sort of freedom tip, if you like. Um, so we, you know, I, I, it's, I was sad when the uh, Coachella thing didn't happen. It would have been really, really cool to do that. But I think you know, next next time, you know, we'll just wait and see. Oh, excellent. Well, this is how things are going to work out. And uh, Jeff, will he's the uh, editing ninja over here, so he'll get all of our boogers all cleaned up, and it'll sound like a, <laughs> okay. like a like a like a like a million dollar job. But um. We want to. We, <laughs> okay. we want to thank you so much for your time, and, and uh, it was a. It, it was an honor to have you on the podcast. Yeah. Thank you so yeah, much, Richard. So much. It was an honor. And if you ever want to come back on again, you know, let us know or let your PR person know, and we'd love to have you again. Oh, please! Uh, that's very kind of you guys. Very, very kind of you. Thank you very much. We, well, we would definitely do that. Absolutely. And uh, have a good day. You it's too. Early day. I know. Yeah. yeah. Have a good one, man. Take care. Cheers. Bye bye. Now. Bye bye. Bye.
Welcome to the night. You think you know Night Demon? Then the Night Demon Heavy Metal Podcast is for you. Step into the darkness as we peel back the curtain to give you an unprecedented, all-access look into the mind and the heart of the demon. We're talking band history, song analysis, studio anecdotes, stories from the road. It's everything a diehard Night Demon fan could want and more. This is the only place to learn the inside scoop the deep dive trivia, the untold tales from the band members themselves and those closest to the Night Demon story. Need more? The sacred Night Demon crypt will be pried open to reveal demo recordings that have never before seen the light of day. All with in-depth commentary by the band and the people who were there for the writing and recording process. This is a gold mine, a treasure trove of all things Night Demon. Head over to nightdemon.net or wherever you listen to podcasts.